Eccoci qua. Buenos dias, signor. Hey, Michele. How are you? Good to see you. Good to you. Same, same. You, same. Never, you never age. You never age. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, allora, presentazione in italiano e poi abbiamo deciso che facciamo in, in anglo, no? Yeah. Sebastian Edwards, chi segue il mio canale eh, l'ha già incontrato in passato, chi segue il Liberi Oltre forse segue anche il mio canale, quindi forse l'avete incontrato in passato, è un collega, sta a UCLA, UCLA, Anderson School of Management, una volta stava al Dipartimento di Economia e girava con delle forbici in un ufficio vicino al mio cercando di tagliare pezzi di me, non ci è riuscito uh, e dopo è scappato, è andato alla Anderson School. Uh, um, Sebastian è uh, originario del Cile e, ed è un Chicago Boy, però un Chicago Boy pentito, sembra dire. o forse un Chicago Boy in transition o forse un Chicago Boy che non vorrebbe essere Chicago Boy che ne so, vediamo we're going to discover it now so, now let's switch to English we wrote a book called the Chile Experiment which oscillates between two topics which overlap but are not exactly the same unless you tell me that you identify the two and one is the so-called Chile Project which was a as you tell us, a, 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 a intentional effort of various American ag US agencies to train and influence economies from Latin America and Chile in particular, that then played a role in the policies of Chile, not only with Pinochet, also before and after, and even now in some sense. Uh, and the other is this mysterious thing, and the people that follow me know that I'm very interested about this uh, mysterious object called neoliberalism. And you're the first that actually attempts a definition of neoliberalism, even if then you back off and then you say, maybe I should use the word with almost, and then it becomes a mess, but we'll do. So here is the choice. How about introducing your book and choosing which one of the two topics you want to address first, or both simultaneously, in case you consider the only example of neoliberalism or the prototype of liberalism, what happened in Chile between 1974 or 82 or 86, you tell me, and and now or two years ago. Up to you. Okay. And let well, me find the cover of your book for, uh, while you talk. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks, Michele, for having me. And it's a great uh, honor to talk to you again. And uh, we had a great time when we were colleagues here. We uh, had uh, debates about economics, but we also uh, had a lot of fun. Well, the book is, as you said, is called The Chile Project, and it's published by Princeton University Press, and its subtitle is The Downfall of Neoliberalism. And as you say, one of the key challenges is to define the neoliberalism, which is a term that has become very fuzzy and very imprecise. And uh, one of the things that I do is that I track back um, how uh, neoliberalism as a term has evolved through time. And um, its, its origins go all the way back um, to, I, 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 I argue, uh, 1938 and what is known as the Lippmann Colloquium in Paris. And um, what happens is that in 1937, the famous uh, American journalist Walter Lippmann publishes a book in the United States called The Good Society. And what Lippmann says is that laissez-faire, or pure capitalism, has become um, a very a problem uh, because it neglects social considerations. And uh, this means that um, the people in many countries are either moving towards fascism or communism. And what he says is that um, what uh, society needs to do is to have capitalism with a bleeding heart of sorts. And his book is published in France, and um, a French philosopher, Monsieur Rougier, calls a group of uh, thinkers to talk about uh, this book. And this is the colloquium, uh, the Lippmann Colloquium. And they decided that, yes, he has a point of view, 
and that this new movement, which is capitalism with a social bent, is going to be called neoliberalism. But then the war comes and they stop meeting. So that's the social, the, the, the historical background. And then it evolves, the term evolves. And in the 1990s, it becomes a bad word. And people uh, start using it. So it's um, interesting to note first. So it's war, it's born as an alternative. Yes. To the pure, absolute, total affair, which never existed, but was theorized by some. And it evolves in Europe in a form. There is something called ordo liberalism, or. Uh, yes. And so, so on. The, so the ordo liberalists, uh, yeah, the ordo liberalists are in Germany. Yeah. And uh, they start, the, there are some representatives of the ordo liberalists uh, in the uh, um, Lidman Colloquium. But then they gather their own force at the end of World War II uh, with uh, uh, Erhard um, um, and, and, and they start the, what some people also call social um, market system. Uh, but it is capitalism with, as I said, a bleeding heart. But in the 1990s, the term evolves and becomes a, a bad word, an adjective that is used to refer to radicals and to, uh, in terms of economic uh, markets and the homos economicals uh, perspective. perspective. Um, and uh, the, the, the term has been installed and is here. So there are two options. Either we say, no, um, it's a bastardized term. We're not going to use it. Or we, as I do in the book, you face it uh, and you say, well, it has become bastardized but we are going to define it for the purpose of this book in a particular form. And the way I uh, define it is I, I, I use uh, Michael Sandel, so the Harvard philosopher perspective, which is which he says neoliberalism is a system that uses the markets, the market organization, to solve every problem in the world. And I say it's not every, but almost every problem in the world. So it's an approach where you use markets to uh, deal with uh, social services, with uh, pensions, uh, with education, uh, with the arts, um, and uh, it's uh, uh, and 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 it, the greatest manifestation historically is in Chile, not in uh, the Reagan uh, uh, in the U.S. and not under Margaret Thatcher. Uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. I claim that it is under Pinochet, and what happens is that this group of Chicago graduates, the Chicago boys, are given a free hand by Pinochet, who is in power under this very severe, very tough dictatorship for 17 years. And then they have this revolution, which actually is very successful from an economics point of view. And then, and I finish the, this introduction, what happens then is that when Chile goes back to democratic rule in 1990. The new governments, which are all center left, and many of them have and members of the cabinet who have been persecuted, tortured, and exiled by Pinochet, maintain the model. And that continues until very recently. And I claim that in 2019, and you and I had a conversation here in your channel about the insurgency in Chile, that sort of sets the downfall of neoliberalism. But what is interesting is that it's so successful that instead of changing it, the, the, the people that take over under democracy, they further it. They change it, of course. It's, a, it's evolving. I say in the book, as the characters of any good novel, neoliberalism in Chile evolves from being very orthodox uh, to becoming what I call at the end inclusive neoliberalism. But we're still social services are provided through market mechanisms, mostly. Well, so let's start from there. So first of all, let's give away with Sandel, Mickey Mouse version of neoliberalism, given that you correct that by adding the almost, the almost being an ambiguous word, as you have to say, <laughs> uh, that needs quantification true. Um, one can try uh, a, Topological and major theoretical definition. So, if one, if you add that almost everywhere, I would have you have to you, for those that listen to us, 
Sebastian does not have a particular penchant for mathematical economics, so it would be a way for irritating him. No, 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 no. Almost everywhere, it would be everywhere dense, the neoliberal, and then the cases of public intervention would be zero. But even in the Chile Pinochet, for example, public education was public. There was public education, but there were vouchers. And you could use you could use you could use the vouchers uh, to go to private schools. Um, you could use the vouchers everywhere. Yeah. So uh, um, interestingly, in your version, you give you give a version of the kind of services that would, uh, in, in in this theory, be assigned to market. Okay. And I think we can safely agree that uh, while some theorists of uh, uh, the school you, you, you mentioned uh, might agree on having those services provided by entirely by some private system, some regulated market system, many others would disagree. So is there, to, to, to understand, and then we'll go to the up, her, the actual implementation in, in Chile. Is there a reference? Is that Gary Becker, maybe, the point of view? The guy that thought that health system are better if they're completely privatized, transportation system are better if they're completely privatized, patient yeah. system are better if they're completely privatized, and so on and so forth? Yeah, so uh, you, you make a very important point, which is we need an anchor. If we use the term, we need to anchor it to a set of ideas and to people's thoughts. And uh, what I claim is, that, and I think it's correct, right, that the anchors for neoliberalism, which I'm not using in a um, down way or, or, or anything like that, I'm using it as, as, as a description. The two anchors are Milton Friedman and Gary Becker. And I also argue that Chicago, for instance, had uh, those two, and, and, and Ronald Coase and, and others were the more uh, orthodox neoliberals, and there were some uh, another group of more pragmatic people, including our common friend Al Harberger. And, How is and he doing? He's doing well. He's going to be ninety-nine years old this year. He's and, always four years, uh, three years ahead of my father. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so he says that uh, he is not going to be very interested in his this birthday. He's waiting for next year when he's going to be a hundred. Understand? You you know that uh, that Rodi Rodi's mother just turned a hundred last year. Ah, wow! I didn't know Rodi, that. Yeah. Rodi came up with uh, from Buenos Aires with a nice photograph and the ah, lady looks sharp. So if you okay. see if you see a little, bring him. Uh, I my see, yeah, I see him every seven or eight weeks or so. All right. so, so, so we need right. that anchor. That's, that's I mean, in case people don't know, Alito Harberger is Al Harberger, the one of the triangles. Yeah, a super triangle man. So, um, so um, uh, Sandel uses uh, Becker as uh, La Bête Noire, right? And as you say, in a Mickey Mouse way, in a very uninteresting way, what he does is Sandel is he sets up the straw man who is Becker, who is not around. He died and then he criticized him in a very not not very serious way in my opinion but what is interesting is that Michel Foucault writes a whole book about neoliberalism and also the chapter on American neoliberalism it's devoted to Becker in and he had admi Foucault admires Becker and speaks uh, uh, about Gary Becker as someone who uh, has a, a, a theory that gives freedom to people, to, 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 to men and women. Why? Because there's no ethics in Foucault's view of Becker. There's just cost and benefits, and if, if, if the benefits exceed cost, then you act accordingly. Um, now, you can, you can have solidarity. I mean, everything can be in your preferences. Uh, but Foucault writes this uh, whole book where he admires uh, Becker. And there's a very interesting situation where Gary Becker doesn't know that Michel Foucault has written about him until they tell him. And there are two seminars in the, uh, at the law school in Chicago where uh, Foucault's main um, student, who is a grown-up philosopher, talks with Gary Becker. And, and they are on video. You can see them in, uh, in YouTube. And Gary is, uh, although Foucault has died, right? Um, uh, okay, now. Yeah, so, but Gary says, this is very interesting, and, 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 and he says, I am not sure that I disagree with anything that Foucault says. 
and, and and he takes us seriously and Foucault of course is very interested in crime and in uh, why society puts people in jail and he's fascinated by Gary Becker's crime theories right? uh, by the way for those that are not familiar with this is a uh... This is on the birth of biopolitics. I don't know if yeah. it's translated in Italian. Most people that listen are probably Italian. I'll figure out what the title is. Yeah, no, I think it's it's it has been translated into into Italian, and it's his lectures uh, in seventy eight, seventy nine. Yeah, the birth yeah, of the biopolitics. Late seventies yeah. uh, object. I will yeah. figure out the, the thing. But, well, uh, okay, fine. So, like, given that Gary is not around, uh, there is a. A relatively well cited paper of mine that he told me he didn't want to publish in JP because while he agreed completely with the result uh, and he thought the result was correct, it was uh, one implication of the paper was that expand making uh, financing public education from the public purse from taxes and having a, a large chunk of uh, uh, the, the public pension system uh, to be public, sorry, the pension system to be public was uh, uh, a way to efficiency and he didn't like that. Now, the thing on, pen, no, no, verbatim, him and Sherwin, actually. Uh, it's okay, the view of economic studies took it. Um, the, the, the point about this is that true, in particular around pension, there is a very old fashioned view very widespread in American conservative people that associate social security creation with Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal policies and therefore see the social security even these current Republican people as you know a product of the devil but we actually know that, that there is no much logic in that that any good economic argument about uh, 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 an efficient pension system would require part that is pay as you go and is financed publicly through an intergenerational system of transfer from uh, from wage labor so the question is how much do we want to take of the personal political uh, position that gary or al or Milton friedman or whoever may have had a certain point in life and make it the essence of their point of view well, I think that we need to 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 focus mostly uh, on uh, mostly on economics. But the um, can, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, mostly on economics, but also the uh, the politics is also important. And if we bring this down to earth, which is the Chilean experiment, it had a lot to do with politics because uh, Pinochet deposes Salvador Allende, uh, who is a threat for the United States and for Western capitalism. And people uh, in the US see him as Fidel Castro uh, and Che Guevara uh, wearing a business suit. And uh, at the end, uh, Pinochet deposes him. And the, these uh, people from Chicago uh, are given, as I said earlier, free hand. And uh, they are pushing what they have learned uh, and, and, and the sort of free markets perspective. And they privatized almost, not everything, but almost everything. They almost is very important here. Uh, they, they are no more for a... For so what is it they privatize? What is it they privatize? So the, the economy in 1973 in Chile is tanking. Uh, if I understand, there is not much support from a lender, for a lender. Uh, and... Uh, I don't think actually they have nationalized very much, but there was already the inheritance of previous government. Uh, no, no, they, they, yeah, they, 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 they nationalized. They, they, again, they nationalized a lot of things, including the whole banking system, except for one bank. And uh, most of the large uh, companies, uh, which were considered to be monopolistic. Uh, so uh, um, there were some. Uh, public state-owned enterprises that were created earlier under the idea of import substitution, right? Uh, so including, for instance, the big steel company. Uh, but again, the um, uh, nationalized a very large amount of, but mostly think that every bank was nationalized and the corporate companies were nationalized. So then the military started privatizing everything. And what it's interesting is that the traditional 
as you mentioned, there were the companies that came from the past were nationalized by the center left governments much later. They and they nationalized um, uh, water treatment companies. Uh, they nationalized uh, the electricity company that was uh, public from the 1950s. So the, 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 the market experiment, I want to make this very clear, the market experiment pushed by the Chicago boys and imposed during the dictatorship becomes so successful that when the left takes over, not only they don't want to get rid of it, but they want to further it. And it's, it generates this true, almost, or I'm going to use almost like an economic miracle where Chile passed from being the number seven or number eight country in Latin America in terms of income per capita to becoming number one by a very wide margin. So everyone who is from Chile from my generation, we lived, we were born and lived under the shadow of Argentina. They, everything that Argentina did was better than Chile. And Chile had an income per capita that was maybe two thirds of Argentina. And in 2001, Chile- and a lot more, So one thing that is important in this, because you actually mentioned this in the book, and actually you characterize as one of the reasons of the failure of neoliberalism, no matter how we decline. But it doesn't uh, fail. Inequality. Chile has much more inequality than even Argentina or I think it's even Brazil. Brazil, Brazil the same thing, yeah. It's a race, right. Uh, in the 90, early 1970s when Allende goes to power, right? Yeah. So uh, when Allende comes to power, Chile is very unequal. Uh, his government is very short. It's only three years. So nothing that happens there is sustainable. Uh, and, and, and it's very far from the steady state. Inflation is 700%, so very far from the steady state. And, and increasing, I mean, going has gone up from 15, 250, 700. So, um, and inequality goes down, the Gini goes down from about 55 to 42 during Allende. Uh, but the last month, because of inflation, wages had not been adjusted. So. We don't know the Gini the last month, but probably it was 60, right? <clears throat> but it's very unequal. And during the, the, the neoliberal period, dictatorship and the 30 years after, inequality starts declining slowly. Um, and uh, right now, it's in the middle of the Latin American scale, right? Exactly in the middle. It's the, med the median in Chile have the same number, like 46, which is very high. A Gini of 46 is very, very high. Now, the PKT project says that the Gini is actually much higher, but I'm not, I don't think that we can vet those data yet. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to take those data seriously. But in the book, I have a whole uh, section where I say, well, listen, there are these data from the PKT project out there, and we have to explore them. But, 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 but the, the, the success that Chile has is amazing. I mean, I, you have to understand that, that Chile had so, never... Let's, let's go back and put a bit of order because maybe it's my fault I took you away. So Chile had a success to a great extent because they, they go from having two-thirds, as you said, of uh, average income per capita in uh, then Argentina at the current about double the last time I look at the number. Chile is very close, above 16,000 dollar per capita and Argentina is actually below, I think, 8,000. So the distance is enormous. Yeah, it, yeah, it depends actually, on how we use it, but yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, there is a distance, yeah. Think, sure. And as you said, uh, inequality did not worsen. In some sense, it got better, but not a lot better because income inequality all across Latin America is extremely high. And Chile right now is neither at the top nor at the bottom of income inequality, if I'm correct, it's Costa Rica, that is probably at the bottom of income inequality. On, on no, it's, a, it's actually it's Uruguay. Uruguay, okay, yeah. Uruguay. Uh, uh, but Chile is in the middle. So, fine. So that's the result. And we will try to look at the result later in terms of policy. Let's go back to the almost. In the book, you don't tell much the story of the almost. You discuss more the political and social event. But it's important to understand 
what is it they privatized the Chicago Boys in the first, say, 15 years? So Alwin goes to power in 89, is that correct? In nine, yeah, he wins the election in 89 and becomes president in 1990. So the, so the return 17. to democracy is, is March 1990 is the return to democracy. Right. So that's 17 years after Pinochet, even if Pinochet had given up power a little bit earlier, right? Yeah, so Pinochet 16 months, 16 years, and 11 months or nine months. So it's it's a little short of 17 years. Okay, and 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 okay. So part of the privatization, one would say, it's bringing uh, Chile to look like Italy, not it, maybe not Italy, United Kingdom or Spain. That is, the banks get more or less privatized. Right, they get uh, fully fully privatized. Banks fully privatized. Right, health uh, system health system becomes semi privatized. Okay, so well, I want to go to that. So there is a bunch of industries that were nationalized, but they were industry that in most countries we consider it's appropriate to have them run more or less in a private uh, sector way with regulation. And then there is the so-called welfare state or public services, health, education, transportation. I don't know what else we want to put into that. Well, what, an, an interesting what elements. What what happens to those? How much of that goes private? How much doesn't? Yeah. So let me give you an interesting example. For all practical purposes, the dictatorship puts an end to public universities. It puts an end to public um, TV station. The TV channel. It's still public, but it is run as if it is private both in a, from an editorial point of view, which is very good, but also uh, from a uh, fin financial point of view. Public universities still exist as such, but tuition is identical than in private universities. So the whole system, and I'm not do, saying this is a cri in, in a critical way, I'm just trying to describe it. The, the whole the document yeah, will be private. Yeah, so, so the whole, the, 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 the system of social services becomes privatized or, or private privately provided and the the the, uh, the most uh, clear case is something that you have worked a lot about and you know a lot about which is the pension system so initially the pension system be, uh, go, moves from being pay as you go to becoming a hundred percent individual savings account um, that has changed in the last, uh, since 2008, uh, but, but that's basically um, the, the biggest change, right? And, uh, um, and I, I, it's very central in the book because uh, it fails, the, that system fails to deliver the results that the Chicago Boys promised. And it becomes the symbol of the failure or the or the injustice or the meanness or the heartless aspect of this model um and people start rallying around that. What are you on this because this you know the pension system fascinates me i've had over this time over this year so many conversations with latin american chilean more or less free market economies and this obsession with having the pension system totally privatized and run in particular in the chilean way but anyhow any assigned to this financial market always bit me as purely ideological. There's nothing either in what we know about financial market empirically or theoretically or in the, any of the models that we write down that suggest that that made sense. Yeah, so it's... A, it's a, I'm fascinated by, the, by, by this, you know, ideological attachment to the private pension system. I wonder where that comes from. My interpretation is that it comes from the disliking of Roosevelt and therefore, by some form of analogy and projection, because Roosevelt did it, it has to be bad. Well, that's it. It has to be bad. So we don't want it. Yeah. Even but that's, doing very well. That's very interesting what you're saying, because we, it, this brings us back to what you were saying earlier, or what we were uh, talking about earlier, about the definition of neoliberalism. So Michel Foucault says in uh, the US and in France and in England, Neoliberal liberalism is a reaction against something, and he names Roosevelt, 
and he names beverage in the United Kingdom. And he says neoliberalism <laughs> is true. against the beverage report from 1947, that is the basis of the welfare state in England, against the New Deal. And in France, it's against what happened after the, the Popular Front. So uh, Foucault, who is fascinated by Becker, some people even accuse him that he fell in love with Becker without having ever met him. Uh, Foucault uh, says, no, yeah, neoliberalism yeah, is yeah, defined yeah, as yeah, a yeah. reaction. <laughs> all, right, all right, let's not go there. Uh, but uh, yes, I do uh, agree in a different set of uh, interviews on the theme with historian Giovanni Federico and, and other, uh, we have agreed that the, what is called neoliberalism, and in some sense, you know, it's very interesting that they associate it to Becker, it's another possibility is to associate it to this. I pulled it out for, uh, for, for the purpose of this conversation. Yeah, oh, yeah, but, uh, that, but that, that's very important because, uh, I mean, and I talk... To Bentham, I mean, the, 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 yes. the, the, to, to, sorry, to the beverage report. Yeah. Um, so, so in in the book, I said so. Uh, going back to the the, the the origins of neoliberalism, the first meeting is the colloquium, the Lippmann colloquium, and Hayek is there, and Mrs. are there, and they disagree with Lippmann. World War Two comes, they cannot meet, of course, and then they reassemble when they create the Mont Pelerin Society, but they don't invite those that at the colloquium are more moderate, as it were, including Lippmann. Lippmann doesn't join the Mont Pelerin Society. So I have a discussion in the book about the role that the Mont Pelerin Society plays in the Chilean reforms. And I sh did a lot yeah, of research. Yeah, over that because you mentioned that actually it's not that big. No, it's not. It's not at all. I mean, the, 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 uh, of the original Chicago Boys, not one is a member of the MPS. Um, Al Harberger and I show a, a letter that uh, a, a correspondence between Gary Becker and Friedman, where they say, how can we convince Al Harberger, who is the father of the Chicago West, to join the Montpellier Society? He doesn't want to join it, right? So it's, um, uh, Hayek does play an important uh, role uh, in, from an ideological point of view, yes. Okay, are you there? I cannot hear you now. Yeah, yeah, no, I turn off the, the microphone as I often do when I move around because I was looking at some citation from uh, from your book, but uh, but you finished a few seconds before I expected, so I had, I didn't have the question ready. Uh, <laughs> and that's uh, the that's the problem with what they say in Italian is la diretta, the live. All right, so let's keep going back to understanding how this experiment works. So the, there is, we agree, I actually agree, neoliberalism is probably mostly a reaction. Interestingly, it's a reaction first in your uh, story, the, the, the pre-World War II story, to the excesses of laissez-faire, or I may say, the fact that the laissez-faire theorists had now realized that workers would organize politically, that income distribution for some people matter, uh, for most people matter, for every people matter, because it has to do with their own income, and this would create a movement and request for public goods and public services that the neoliberal model, the old laissez-faire model, not taking into account. And this happens even before economic theorists realized in the 40s and 50s that there are good reasons well, there is the theory of externalities, but there is a good reason, you know, private information, blah, 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 for which a lot of these very important uh, goods are hardly provided in an efficient way by, by the market and require some form or another of mechanism of intervention, mechanism of control, uh, change of incentive from the pure market ones. Uh, then there is the reaction IX style, uh, to the beverage report and to the fact that, yes, by the 1940s and 50s, the economies of the Western world are very socialized, are incredibly socialized, as they've never been since, okay? Part is the effort of the uh, war economy, part is the effort of the Great Depression, part is some imitation of what's happening in Russia. It's a mixture, and so I... So you seem to suggest that the neoliberalism that characterized the Chicago boys, the generation before you at least, 
is somewhat Hayekian. And that from this point of view, Alito is a bit of an exception with his practice. Yeah, but we have, we have, I, I, I like, I like very, but let, let me, let me say something. I like very much the way you put it as a reaction. And, but we need to add, sprinkle the Latin American flavor here. In Latin America, it's a react, in Chile is a reaction against uh, the Allende government, Allende, right? But also it's a reaction against Cepal, ECLA, and Raul Prebisch, yeah. and yeah. import substitution. So the bet right. noirs of the Chicago boys, if you talk to them in person, la bet noir is Raul Prebisch. And the CEPAL, the UN, the United Nations Commission, Economic Commission for Latin America, also known in English as ECLA, and or ECLAC, the Latin Sea is Caribbean, and import substitution. So, Chile has an import tariff. This is, we haven't talked about that import tariff of about a hundred percent, with quotas and licenses and prohibitions, and the Chicago boys lower that to three percent flat. Total, no difference in import duties, and then. The new governments, the ones from the left, sign uh, free trade agreements with almost every country in the world. So Chile basically has zero import tariffs now compared to Argentina, where you cannot import. It's very difficult to import anything compared to Brazil, which is very protectionist. So let, let, me, let me go there, because, you know, what we're trying to do, what I want to try to do, and the book, if you want, the book is also full of, how can I say, and not gossip, of... Uh, Intellectual anecdotes, intellectual anecdotes. Anecdote. Uh, Sebastian, uh, what are you then? The, the, the grandson, the nephew? I don't remember your relation with uh, what's his name, the, the famous uh, uh, Chilean uh, writer by your Jorge, Jorge, Jorge Edwards, he's my uncle. Jorge, yeah. He's your uncle, right? And I know this, and, and I hope Sebastian doesn't get offended. Sebastian always wanted to be more a writer than an economist. But <laughs> he ended up being an economist. And so this book has a bit of the novel, a character, political, economic novel in it, so much so that it starts with an introduction to the dramatis persona. Uh, it tells you who the characters are so you can actually follow them along the, the, the lines. So if you want to go more on the, uh, how can I say, on the back and forth among personality, which might be interesting and interests me as well, uh, in particular, the role of the, those I knew uh, that I've known, uh, fine. But uh, for my part, let me push more on the economic the interaction between economics and ideology, right? So you, you're quite the, the thing you just said is very important. In Latin America, uh, there is a version of social democratic policies that is still fashionable in certain left around the world, which has a lot to do with what Sebastian mentioned: import substitution. In Italy, it characterized the fascist policies as well. So the idea that you have to be self-sufficient, basically. But trade is not good in general. Trade with other countries is not good, in particular if you're a poor country. Poor yeah, countries because there's, a, there's an equal exchange. There is the whole exactly. theory, the Lenin, Lenin uh, imperialism, the superior face of that, Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg, then uh, I mean, uh, and, yeah. and all the, the American yeah. new so, yeah. so, so it's an equal exchange, and they claim that the terms of trade will turn against the poor countries ever, always. They didn't realize that lithium, the price of lithium, was going to go through the roof, and the price of oil, and so on. So, self sufficiency and industrialization that was the karma, right? Can I hear you? I, I always, um, because I have to answer some idiots on, the, on, well, there's always some idiot, because we are live, there's always some person that is particularly stupid and doesn't understand what a, a conversation is and needs to um, convince us that is actually more stupid than even I had assumed. That's okay. I have to take care of that. And that's, uh, so, uh, good. So, there is that part, and in particular, that part says, and it's quite interesting, Sebastian, that that part is, you know it better than me, completely common also to the extreme European right. Right. Trade is not good, unless you are the United States of America or China. <laughs> Any right. other country do not trade. Right. right. And so that's very common in Latin America among leftists, and not only leftist government, before the Chicago boys arrived. So the Chicago yeah. boys opened up that, and I would like to know, first, what your evaluation is about... Um, 
how much this played a role, free trade? No, the, 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 the freeing of trade is what... So remember the background. Chile is declining and it's by now has the same income as Ecuador. This is 19... Whatever, 19... Before this, right? And, and then Chile now has twice or three times more income than Ecuador. So it is a revolution and it's very successful in th those terms. And what it does is that um, uh, we have to explain what is behind it. And I think it's mostly free trade, which forces productivity to go up. And if you look at total factor productivity calculations, which I've done a lot of them, it just goes through the roof for 10 years. Then it starts petering down. And so the, the opening of the economy means the end of industrial uh, of the of, of, of parts of the manufacturing sector for instance chile assembled 19 different brands of automobiles most of them they made they assembled because it was only assembly uh, 200 cars per year 200 right and now chile has zero automobiles assembled in chile they are all imported so that came to an end. The brutality of, of uh, the brutality of comparison. In fact, I confirm, I remember one of the first uh, best paper I saw on what uh, total factor productivity actually is in its growth. It's a paper by some Chilean economists maybe 30 years ago showing that the big growth of, of total factor productivity in Chile actually has, and this is why some of this trade is not liked, and I would like to ask you how much did this play a role, because then we're gonna get to the last 10, 15 years uh, and, and let's say the revolt against neoliberalism uh, in uh, creating a revolt because it happens through shutting down of inefficient firms and opening up of new ones that do different things. And the shutting down of inefficient firms always has a social cost. Some guys have to find a new job. Some guys remain unemployed. So what happened, so that's, you're absolutely right. So what happened is that the cost, the transitional costs, took place during the dictatorship. So politically, it had no impact. Now, what is very important is that trade is open and the exchange rate is freed and the peso is depreciated in real terms very significantly. And that means that Chile can start exporting a lot of things that it had a comparative advantage for, but because the exchange rate was so overvalued, the peso was so overvalued, he didn't export. For instance, wine. Chile has perfect conditions for producing quality wine uh, and certain uh, varieties are very well good in Chile, but the exchange rate meant that Chile could not produce them or export them. So you lower import tariffs, the exchange rate depreciates and people, there's a lot of dislocation. Yeah, and people, people, people who lose their jobs cannot demonstrate because there's a dictatorship. And by the time the economy, uh, the, the okay, politics is open, well, uh, let, me, let, me, let me finish, let me finish. By the time the politics is open in 1990, the transition already has happened. And they are, the people who were producing, uh, assembling cards are now producing, I'm going to, this is a caricature, but they are exporting $100 bottles of, 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 of Carmen Air, right? Or, uh, and, 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 and so uh, the... They don't want that anymore. Right. So, by, by, and by then we are better than Argentina, which is what everyone wants in Chile. Uh -uh. <laughs> but this we will not explain to most of the audiences. We'll get too much into the details of Latin America. Uh, no, no, Latin you have to realize that every Latin American country wants to beat Argentina in soccer. And the only country that can do that occasionally is Brazil. Well, occasionally. <laughs> They've done it open, let's face it. Uh, if, I, if I'm not erroneous, they have still more World Cup than anybody else. Right? That's true. Even if Argentina caught up with Italy, I think, this year. Uh, the other bete noir, as you call it, bete noir, uh, not bete, bete noir, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Chicago Boys and myself and you probably, if I recall, is capital mobility, financial openness. Uh, that's another thing that uh, happened in Chile. And it's something that uh, makes effect. Uh, maybe you want to tell, you know, there was a huge financial crisis in the middle of the right. Pinochet experience. Uh, if I write, uh, very, very lost the job on that, the minister, uh, and you do mention it in your book. Uh, 
So yeah. how do you see that? What's the evaluation? How much is that part of neoliberalism and how positive or negative is that? Because that's an issue on which we still have a lot of uh, yeah. controversies around the world. Contrary so, to free trade, most yeah. economists would agree, uh, on free so capital Chile, yeah. So Chile, Chile lives through everything. So at first, there's completely forbidden to move capital in and out of the country. I mean, you have to ask for a license and, and so on, very difficult. Then uh, it uh, opens up and because it's reforming and privatizing, it receives a huge amount of capital coming in. And that creates a current account deficit of around 12, 14% of GDP. And the Chicago boys say it doesn't matter. They use what later is known as the Lawson Doctrine from uh, Nigel Lawson, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom saying, if these are private monies and there's no fiscal deficit, it's just a private sector. But then those monies went away and there was a huge crisis. So that took, uh, it took a few years to repair that. And then Chile starts growing, growing, growing. And then ca capital starts coming in. And Chile invents controls on capital inflows. It's a Chilean invention. And they are not controlling capital leaving the country, but coming in. And they impose a tax on capital coming in, which is by, uh, it's, it's implemented by a deposit that you have to make in the central bank for a certain number of years, and it earns no interest. And at that time, interest rates, global interest rates were high. The treasury, the 10-year treasury was, I don't know, five and a half percent. So it was not zero as until recently. And it, it, it was a tax equivalent. And Chile then managed capital inflows. And that system was copied all over the world in the emerging countries. And little by little, Chile started taking them away until now there's free capital mobility. But it's very quite stable. So how, do you, how do you see your evaluation now, at, uh, leaving aside the historical detail, uh, Sebastian? No, I, no I think that... that, that uh, to, amigo, to amigo Roderick, can you? No, of, of course, uh, Danny Roderick is totally uh, thinks that it's very dangerous. Uh, he wrote a very nice blurb for the book. So uh, I got him to write nicely about the book and John Cochran. So I have the two extremes. Uh, <laughs> so Cochran liked the book and, and so did Roderick. So that's that's a good, and, and I hope but that I, people... Uh, apart from our jokes about Roderick, I mean, what's your evaluation of the role the free capital mobility had in the Chilean experience and may have? In the no, I, yeah, I, I, I think that if we if you tie it up with the uh, private pension system, it's very important because since there is this capital market, um, uh, compo this uh, capital market component of the pension system, it allows the pension management companies to diversify their portfolios, um, and uh, um, around forty percent. It varies from year to year of the um, um, monies that are managed by those pension funds uh, uh, managers are international uh, securities. So the, the portfolios are very, very well diversified. And I think that if you, if you rely so heavily on the private sector for pensions, where at the peak, it was almost one time GDP, the amount of money that was being uh, managed by the pension funds, uh, you need to have a very diversified portfolio. Otherwise, the Chilean companies that are listed are not that many. And you would end up having a portfolio with banks and a few um, mining companies and, and, and retail companies. So, Which is uh, the disaster that they have done. Yeah, but that yeah. actually, you see, it's very interesting. Uh, let me ask you, one of the tenants, right, of this uh, neoliberal view <clears throat> that, Sometimes I sympathize, sometimes I not, but I try to use economic analysis and not my prejudices to figure sure. out what works and what doesn't, is that competition is, is the key. I know that I tend to think so. There are cases in which I don't think so. There are very rare cases, for example, preservation of natural resources. I think monopoly is a lot better. But competition in general, information also is a bit of a problem, but that's another topic. Uh, certainly on financial markets, there's very little that says the competition financial market is bad. There are some cases in which it leads to bad outcomes, but in general, it's good. 
So these guys, what led these Pineras guys or whatever was uh, the team doing it in setting up such an oligopolistic system in which basically the saving of the working class of Chile were left to what, seven? Were they seven? Well, they're seven, yeah. So, but, but, that, but that's, a, that's, that's the... Yeah, that, 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 that charge enormous fees and with restricted access to financial markets and no competition whatsoever to obviously do what economic theory suggests would happen in a situation like that, do it poorly and extract big rent. Why? Yeah, no, no, so, well, it's, it's, yeah, but it's, it's more complicated than that. So when they, so the system, the pension system that existed before was highly fragmented. There were like 55 different, so the, Railway company had one pension system for it's those that were yeah, going to, yeah, yeah, for trains going around the world, right? Yeah, yeah. So they simplified it, replaced it, and when it's launched in 1981, there may have been 20 or 25 companies that started managing these monies, and then they became consolidated because of economies of scale. So the oligopolistic nature is the result of the evolution of the system. It was not created like that. And then your concern is, as it evolved towards oligopoly, why didn't they do something about it? And that has to do with political economy, with lobbying, with a lot of things of that sort, right? And the, the main problem is, or one of the main problems is that these companies charge for managing uh, the savings charge a fee that is a flow. They don't charge on the assets under management. Every time you contribute, you, you add to your savings, they take something out, right? And, um, and, and, and the, the, the challenge there is that if you start from zero, a system like this, the first year there's zero assets under management. So uh, how, do, how do these companies get any income year one, year two, uh, until year, I don't know, 50? So, and they never changed it. So I, 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 I'm very critical of the system in the book. I have a whole chapter on that. And I said that was the but Achilles at heel. And self-respected economists thought the system was great from day one. So the curiosity is, and you're answering it, even call it political economy, it means... The ideology, when the push comes to shovel or when the money hit the wallet, eventually gives in to more practical consideration. There's money to be made and got friends that need to make money. Yeah, but, but I want to, uh, I, I don't disagree with what you just said, but I, I want you, I want to emphasize that it evolved into that. It's not that they created no, no, no a monopoly. No, because you can create, I mean, the import substitution was that you gave licenses to import, I don't know, uh, electric uh, pumps to one person, right? Uh, and, 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 and you created a monopoly from the start. Here, it was created as competitive and it evolved into oligopolistic. To the second part, if you were to that, was neoliberalism uh, as interpreted in the, in, the, in the Chilean version, a victim of its own success? Yeah. So let me, I, I finish the book. The, 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 the last chapter opens by saying this whole story that I've told you about the greatest or one of the greatest economic revolutions of the second half of the 20th century, uh, which then ended up in an insurgency and in changing the model. And we don't know where it's going to go yet. I say you can explain this or you can summarize it with two words, success and neglect. Success is easy, right? You were like Ecuador and now you are like Portugal, right? That means you are successful. <laughs> neglect, it was, has two parts to it in, in, in my analysis. One is that they neglected income distribution. They said, as many people in Chicago, I, I, I make the point that when I was in Chicago graduate, the, we, didn't, we were not taught anything that had to do with personal distribution of income, zero courses. Right, so the, the, George the, view, right? No, well, George had a, has a chapter in the book, but he never got to that chapter when he lectured. Right, so <laughs> the neglect 
No, fa uh, fa factorial distribution, of course, we did everything about capital, labor, and, uh, and so on. So uh, the neglect is, one is income distribution. By the second neglect that I talk about, the, the neglecting is that at some point, the Chicago Boys declared victory and just withdrew from the ideological battle and from the ideological or intellectual or doctrinary conversation. Right? So they said, we won, uh, and, uh, and now we're going to go out and make money. And they joined boards of corporations and this they became... The part, the part you have at the end in which you talk about more the present, the constitutional convention and debate. Yeah. Yes. Can you, can you go free a, a bit over there and explain also what the, let's say, what the current status of the views in Chile and around, is, say, the last 10 years? Like yeah, so what, 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 so the, the very fast growth sort of slowed down. So Chile, after growing at seven and a half percent for 10 years or around seven and a half percent, started growing at five, at four, at three. Um, and uh, the, the old guard started either retiring or making money. And the new generation was uh, in pro environment pro-income distribution, politically correct, and they formed a political movement uh, like Podemos in, uh, um, in Spain. And this ended up in the big revolt and insurgency of 2019, which was, there was a lot of pressure, barricades, uh, they put, they set on fire 25 metro stations, um, lots of violence, and it was thought that we needed a new social pact. And the way to do it was to write a new constitution. And there was a constitutional assembly which wrote a draft that was very radical and that declared that Chile was a plurinational country. It gave a lot of power to the indigenous groups. It talked about restitution of property to the indigenous group. And, and uh, and it gave I that and I commented and I understand it was rejected also. It was rejected. So that that to uh, it to be written in the in the whole of the political science. Yeah, but but what is, what is interesting is that yeah, but what is, impressive visit. No, but what is interesting, Michele, is that there is a, a referendum that asks people, do you want a new constitution? And yes wins seventy five percent of the vote. They write the constitution and then they ask again, do you want to approve this constition? And no gets sixty-three percent of the vote. And now we and are they starting didn't say, yes, I want a crazy new constitution. They wanted a distant one. <laughs> right. So now now Chile is going through a second attempt at writing a constitution that makes sense, a common sense constitution. May I ask uh, it has nothing to do with your book, but isn't that funny? And isn't it a symptom of classical Latin America fundamentalism ideology that instead of proceeding step by step by change these, fix the, I don't know, they did a few things. If I understand, for example, now university, public university in Chile is free, right? it's tuition free. So yeah, yeah. So that, that changed. That, that, that 60% of people, no, and private, it doesn't matter which university you go to. Oh, private too. So they also yeah. go so, voucher so, it's, so if you are in the 60% lowest part of the income distribution, you can go to any university that has uh, is accredited for free. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's a part of the end or the downfall of neoliberalism. Right. right. Um, and to me, that I'm notoriously a neoliberal, at least I'm accused of it, this sounds absolutely reasonable. Uh, 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 so... But the, the question is more methodological. It has to do with the atmosphere that is often engulfing. I was in Mexico recently, and, and it's still going around the left uh, there too. Very ideological. We have to redo everything perfectly. So instead of changing things like this, the pension system that clearly needs a serious reform in Chile, and it's going to be tough, and, and this and that, they want to redesign the another book of dreams. Yeah. So there's a, of, there's a lot of there's a lot of attack instead of a more pragmatic Alito Harberg attack. Yeah, the, uh, the, because ideology is is very important, there, and and in 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 Latin America, uh, and uh, uh, so is in Italy by that for that matter. But 
but the other explanation was given to me many many years ago by your co-author and my good friend uh, david levine who said these are social arrangements that have multiple equilibrium and you jump from one to the other right you don't go slowly it's not that you have a settled path and you go gradually you jump from one to the other uh, that there may be a little bit of that uh, um, as well but i think that at the end the neglect for income distribution is it's like a, a pressure cooker right so inequality starts building pressure and it explodes at some point and they find some kind of arrangement that it's like patchwork or band-aid that bring the system down for a few years maybe two or three decades uh but no more than that right and now it varies from country to country because i think that argentina and mexico for instance are very very important the uh from a cultural point of view the argentines believe that there is a world conspiracy against argentina at every level right they want to take their natural resources they don't want them to win the world cup they don't want to acknowledge that they have the best uh, uh, I, tell you a secret. I tell you a little secret italians believe the same and as you know 51 percent argentinian claim italian origin. italians right, right. believe that even more than argentinian Right. So in Mexico, Mexico, it's not that Mexico is the, the, the obsession with the United States. I mean, the poor Mexico, uh, uh, which uh, Benito Juarez said, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. Right. But it is. Exactly. Yeah. But it is true. You're, you're right. There, there are these refundational and, and there's no gradualism. There is no so, but I wanted to be curious about because you see, it happens very often. I mean, I remember many years ago when I was young into politics, learning about Brazil trying to write a new constitution. It was a gigantic book that was uh, trying to regulate, you know, the minimum details. Yeah, they did that. That's a, that's from the 1990s. The, Brazil has a new constitution. I think I it's 19. Well, what's yeah. the intellectual environment that produces that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, in, in closure, in closure. Uh, uh, so you, okay. I'm, I'm. At least this is the first author that I. That I I'm not trying to please my old friend. It's, but at least you know you stick out your finger. You say, listen, li neoliberalism for me means this. Okay. It has nothing to do with Thatcher and Reagan and Prodi or Draghi or what they say. Yeah, you understand. In Italy, neoliberalism is the separation of the current the account that the treasury holds at the central bank from which you can draw freely if you close that account then you are a new liberal <laughs> well that was that was that was another component of the chilean neoliberalism but but the the, the basic is micro and it is use market mechanisms for almost everything uh, so given that uh, if you have to now Forecasting is notoriously difficult. About the future, it's even worse. And about one own country, it's tremendously difficult. Where do you think the current wave will take Chile? Back to Argentina or to a more reasonable second version of neoliberalism, or the original one that is some form of social market mechanism? No, I think it's going to go to uh, it's going to attempt at least at, uh, to have a social democratic system. There is agreement that the new constitution, the second attempt to make it now to write it, it's going to uh, declare constitutionally in the sort of uh, principles, declaration of principles, that it is a social democratic system, meaning that there are social rights that are constitutionally protected and assured but it is going to say that it's going to the state will provide them gradually and to the extent that it has the means chile does have which are, surprisingly argentina has not have it but chile does have the trauma of having had a thousand percent inflation right so uh, uh, the the notion that the fiscal accounts have to be more or less balanced is ingrained in most people in Chile. So, so I think that we're trying, the, the country is going to try to move towards social democracy. Um, uh, people are smart enough to realize that a Southern Cone country is not a Nordic country, so they are not going to try to be Finland. 
uh, but maybe more New Zealand, right? And the, the big challenge is to transform the Gini, which is now 46, into 35, right? That's the, that's the big challenge, and to provide equal opportunity. And, and you think that that will be through transfer and taxing or through uh, uh, different structural policies of uh, access? No, trans it, it has to be done through transfer and taxes. So the, the OECD, as you know, has genies before taxes and transfers and after taxes and transfers. And before taxes and transfers, Chile is like Spain and the UK. And after, it's 15 points higher. Chile basically doesn't move. Before and after tax and transfer is the same. And so they, Chile, there is no redistributional policy. Well, pension is obviously a big deal of that. The right. system is another big deal. So yes. obviously, if you don't reform those, which is what I think they would have started from, they're doing fine with the university, do the other two big Yeah, deals. now they're trying, with it, but, yeah, but they, they need more taxes and they are now trying to get a uh, tax reform. And they are flirting or they are considering or they have proposed, a like new government has proposed a, a wealth tax which does not work they don't work they're very difficult to collect um but the inheritance tax is very low uh, property taxes are low but mostly what's, chile, what, what, what's the fiscal burden in chile it's uh 21 21 percent yeah so so but but it's very difficult uh, michele because if you look at the oecd gives you four categories of taxes, sales tax, income tax, corporate in, corporate tax, um, and, uh, and, and property tax. Chile is in the median in all of them except individual taxes, personal income tax. And the problem is that the exempt uh, part is, go, is very high. So middle class people pay, pay no income taxes. And w politically, it's very hard to tell them, yes, we're going to respond to your demands but by, taxing wait, you. by taxing you. And, and, and then they're going to burn the country again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think at least, you know, if it were, maybe we understood each other. I'm not sure how much our followers understood. But this would be a, a good closing in the sense that is a moral in this, right? Yeah. The project has, has made its mistake as exaggerated in a number of dimensions, driven by ideology or maybe interest, but has transformed the country into a middle-income country that is growing, and now is facing a conundrum, which is, yes, I can respond to the demand for more equality and more uh, dignity and so on, but in order to do that, I need money to transfer, and in order to collect that money, I probably have to tax you. Yeah. But, 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 well, even if, but let me close on then on instead on, on a more serious question. I don't know if actually this has the answer because I know it's difficult. We have a Gini index of 42 or whatever it is, or 45. 45, yeah. You hardly have a middle class in the proper sense. Uh, there is, there is a strong middle class in the sense that these are people whose children go to university. Uh, it doesn't mean that they find good jobs after they graduate uh, because there are lots of journalists recently graduated journalists in a world that has no newspapers where the news go through twitter right so but but there is a middle class in the sense that these are people who own their houses their homes they uh, uh, their children go to university and they have uh, they are educated they have a Aspiration. The problem is that lately those have been sort of frustrated, and and uh, the, yeah. So, in order to consolidate this, we need what what we said. We need more. China, for example, I know from the data as a, as a, as an attendance to undergraduate colleges, that is percentage of the population and of the the kids in the cohort is higher than Italy. So from that yeah, point, it's, of very, view, it's 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 very very high. But that, uh, uh, that's the good part. The bad part is, as I said, they don't find jobs in the areas that they choose because, mm, as I said, journalism is a favorite, uh, uh, among other things, because it's very inexpensive for the universities to teach uh, and uh, to the, the journalists uh, uh, because you don't need uh, labs, you don't need much in terms of uh, equipment, right? 
So there is a lot of education. Well, okay. Well, otherwise, we get into too complicated. So for people that don't know, enrollment in Chile in tertiary education is way above Italy, yeah. way above Italy, since about 15 years ago. Chile has been yeah. growing in its... It's, it's a remarkable uh, growth. So on, on a number of dimensions, it's a true success. Uh, and also they graduate. Italy has a relatively high enrollment rate, but a very small graduation rate. It goes from 65%, 70% of enrollment to 30. Yeah, so Chile had a very high graduation rate until recently because it was not free. So people took it seriously. And, uh, and, and they gra now that it's free, graduation rates are coming down. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. But that's what any economic analysis would have told well, you. Well, right? you're so neoliberal at the heart that you say these nasty things, you know. But, uh, <laughs> so I hope that well, your readers, uh, your readers uh, uh, read the book. Uh, it's not about the book selling. Is coming out, the book is coming out in May, you told me, at Princeton. Right? In, yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's published by Princeton, and uh, it's called The Chile Project, and it should come out in uh, April. Uh, yeah, they I say totally may but they totally say totally may totally. but it always comes out it's available in amazon uh earlier than than than, than they say okay well uh, actually i closed that one well, okay i will i will link that. sebastian thanks a lot this was very interesting we hey, Michele, hope thank you thanks for <laughs> thanks for yeah. having me in your program and uh, i hope to see you in person soon We'll have to call you next time I come to. I do come to Los Angeles a bit often, but uh, but, uh, but the sun uh, takes. Uh, I have to remember to call you. We'll yeah, ahead. call me, call me, and you can come with your son, and we can. Uh, we'll, we can we'll, we'll, we'll have a dinner party for you here at the house. You are still living at that old place, or Changing no? I have a new. I have, I have a, a, a new house. Uh, you will like. Nice. It. All right, sir. Have a good okay. afternoon in LA. Take Thank care. you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Ciao, ciao. Ok, bye. Hasta luego. Grazie a tutti. Salutiamo Sebastian. E, e niente. Allora, sì, è in, in inglese, perché Sebastian parla inglese. Eh, sono spuntati alcuni che ho dovuto bloccare a chiedermi perché faccio invito delle persone in parole in inglese, visto che sono italiane. <ride> Però queste osservazioni sembrano molto divertenti. E almeno uno che riesce a affrontare la questione del neoliberalismo in maniera seria e, e, e database. Grazie a tutti, ci si vede sui canali di Liberi Oltre fra 4 ore e 10 minuti. Ciao ciao!